Hello and welcome again uh, back to the podcast and the next installment of our Encounter Lessons. Dr. Qualls is going to be writing on Psalm 119 and we've entitled that The Word of God Gives Wisdom. He's done a very good job thus far and this is another really good lesson. I'm glad that uh, he's writing for us this week. Before we get into that, I'm going to talk about me and, and the things that I get to do for our denomination uh, and make you aware of some things you might not know about. First is the Cumberland Presbyterian Evotions. Um, these are done every single day. You can find those at cpcmc.org forward slash evotions. So just like devotions, but take off the D. These are written uh, when I can uh, by people all across the denomination, pastors and lay people and elders and Sunday school teachers. And each day um, they bring us a quick meditation from a selected scripture. Uh, and you can have those uh, each morning, uh, I'm working very hard on getting the email uh, subscription to work again, but no luck for two years. I'm trying hard. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't, but I'm trying very hard. The other things I want to show you then are just some stuff that you can get through Facebook. Uh, I do have an, I started a Evotions Facebook page, so you can subscribe to that page, like that page, and check it out every morning. You can find it by typing in at CP Evotions, and that'll bring you to that page, and then you can um, you can um, join that that page right there and like it, and it'll pop up in your new screen. So that I'm just now rolling out. Hopefully here sometime soon we'll start doing them on video, uh, and then I'm going to try to get them in the future just as a daily uh, podcast, just a real quick thing, so you'll be able to subscribe to that through the various means. But that's not yet. We're getting there. But other pages, Facebook pages, that'll keep you in the know. We have a Discipleship Ministry Team page uh, that if you get hooked up to, you'll be able to see you know, the links that we have. We're having the Day in the Park coming up, and you can get some information there. Of course, that is not uh, coming up the way it should. Why would it? Uh, we also have the Ministry Council page. Uh, so that is a page you can like, and that'll have all the information from our different ministry teams um, that you can take a look at. Uh, and then, let's see here. We also have a Facebook page for the encounter. This is where I'll put up different news of different things that are going on. Uh, you'll find these lessons, discussion questions, memory verses. In the future, I'll um, develop that a little bit more. But if you like that page, you'll get the information from the encounter that we need to get out to you. And so that's just some things that we have on Facebook that you can... Uh, go to, like, and you can be kept in the loop for our denominational stuff. Also, if you want to write for Evotions, send me an email at cfleming at cumberland.org. Again, that's cfleming, F-L-E-M-I-N-G, at cumberland.org. And uh, just say, hey, Chris, I want to write for these. So, And I'll get you set up and ready to go, and I look forward to many more writers. I like to, I like to read the talent that we have in the Cumberland Presbyterian Church. All right, so... Back to where we are. So today, Dr. Qualls, again, it's Psalm 119. Um, our prayer for illumination today. <laughs> Having troubles. Technical difficulties. Almost there. All right. Our... Uh, Prayer for illumination. Almighty God, you have the words of eternal life. Give us an understanding of these words that we might be a light to those in darkness. Amen. And our memory verse is, Happy are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Happy are those who keep his decrees, who seek him with their whole hearts. So that's where we're at today. Um, we are talking about the word of God giving wisdom. In his introduction, Dr. Qualls writes that Psalm 119 is a primer for living in the new world where God reigns. This world exists alongside the one we are most accustomed to. If we're going to thrive in the new world, we need a guide. And that word of God, and the word of God is that guide. So I am gonna share with you a um, share with you the screen here. Um, I use this chart in a college class that I teach. And they find it very helpful. And so and I'm going to share it with you guys. When Dr. Qual says that there's another world that is existing alongside the one that we're most accustomed to, 
it's very important. As I teach the uh, college class, I've realized that uh, younger folks uh, don't necessarily see spirituality as an alternate world. They instead see it as something as an add-on. Like this world is the reality, and we use spirituality to, to flourish in this world, and this world is really um, what's real. And that's the best case scenario. Worst case scenario is that uh, a lot of our younger folks just discount the um, understanding of spirituality at all or an alternate world where God is king. And and uh, so anyway, uh, Ninian Smart uh, had wrote something. He kind of came up with what we call seven dimensions of religion. It contains doctrinal, mythological, ethical, ritual, experiential, institutional, and material dimensions. And if all seven of these things are in all seven of these things you can find in religion and so what i have said to my college students and i've said to you know churches that i go to um, materialism or naturalism or whatever i would like to say politics have actually become uh, a religion a substitute religion it's a way in which uh, people structure their world it's become a religion in many ways and so here's here's what i've just thought and on the Christian side, you have doctrinal, the doctrinal dimension, which of course is the teachings of the church, scriptures, and the dogma of the church, right? These are the things that are important uh, to uh, the church, we'll say historic Christian thought. On the other side, when you start thinking about governments or politics as being uh, your religion, you have ideological teachings, you, maybe of the Constitution, like today you have constitutionalists, originalists, people who, who want to change constitutions different various political platforms, if you're Republican or Democrat, if you're an independent or whatnot, you see that uh, teachings of that platform, if you will, and then ultimately teachings of self-fulfillment. And that's just because pop psychology is one of the tops, if not the top, um, revenue generator in, in books today. Uh, so that's that. The mythological, of course, you have stories. That's stories that support community. It's a framework by which to think about reality. So if you think of our scripture mythologies, and again, we don't use mythology in the pop understanding, but mythology in a story that creates a framework of understanding life. All right, so it's not about true or false. But you have the creation story. You have the story of Jesus, story of Exodus, Tower of Babel, the flood. These kinds of things help us to understand and think about the world through the, the lens of, of, the, of the scripture. On the flip side, you have mythological stories, things like George Washington crossing the Potomac, right? You have stories about maybe like the French Revolution or the Bolshevik Revolution. These, these events become stories that symbolize things and, and they give your movement uh, hands and feet, if you will, a concrete way of thinking things through, uh, through stories. It, it reveals things. Then you have the ethical, uh, which is... Uh, from the Christian standpoint is that you have your roles and your do's and your don'ts from Revelation, from on high. That's what we would say Scripture is a revealed thing and that the Holy Spirit reveals to us and inspires us to know the difference between right and wrong in politics or if, if politics has become a religion, it's the rules that are defined upon, defined by agreed upon values or documents of the group. And then it's enforced by things like the Supreme Court, you have class conflict, and then equity, right, is the major um, equity, equality, whatever whatever best light you'd like to put it, would be the uh, how you define what is good, bad, what works, what doesn't. Then you have ritual. Uh, in the church, we have communion, we have preaching, we have the spiritual disciplines, we have symbolisms uh, throughout our sanctuary. On the governmental side or political side, you have, of course, elections. You have like things like the Pledge of Allegiance. You have different flags. You have protests and demonstrations. You have social media groups. And these are all rituals um, and in a very real sense. And then you have the experiential dimension. Uh, in church, you have worship. We have uh, senses of gratitude and awe. We have a sense of guilt, of sin. We think about redemption. We think about fellowship and the communal experience and then uh, our personal connection with the divine. Uh, on the political side, you have redemption as the perfect society, as personal fulfillment. You belong to a certain tribe, um, and you seek to belong to a tribe, whatever that tribe may be. And then, uh, of course, you have a personal connection with the ideology uh, that 
uh, you're you're a part of. And then you have the institutional dimension. Um, this is this is like what is instituted about your culture. So for the church, it defines the rules and experiences, the attitudes. Uh, it controls membership and participation in the group. On the political side, ideologies, platforms, whatever, constitution, defines the rules, defines the experiences, defines what your attitude should be. And it also, as we've seen, like just for the fun of it, let's just say cancel culture, it defines the membership and participation in their group as well. And then finally, you have the material dimension. With churches, of course, you have the sanctuary. Material is anything you can hold, you know, physical, see, those kinds of things. So you have sanctuaries, you have like symbolisms like the cross, the bread, the wine, the hymnals. These all point toward the material portion of a, of a religion. In uh, religion of politics or whatnot, you have capital buildings, you have flags, you have monuments, and you have statues, right? That's why, I mean, like people didn't understand why monuments and statues came under fire. It's because politics has become a substitute religion uh, to Christianity. And so these monuments and statues mean much, much more than it would for someone else. The more involved you are in politics, the more statues mean something. Uh, so anyway, just wanted to put that out there because I think this is what, this is what we face in our current time is that uh, we have a society that's more and more rejecting religion as a source of... Um, truth or as a source of meaning and instead uh, being drawn toward politics, activism, whatever you say, as a place of meaning and purpose and, and a place to be and belong. And so I think the psalm then sp speak to us in a contemporary society very, very loudly whether or not we want to uh, hear it or not. So anyway, that's the introduction on the historical setting. Um, Dr. Qualls writes, when we get beyond a one-dimensional notion of obeying rules, Torah keeping becomes the source of life. It opens up a world rather than shutting us off from, from one another. It opens up a world rather than shutting us off from one. The psalmist reminds us that the law of God is the source of light, life, joy, and delight. In fact, the word delight, which closes out today's scripture, is repeated seven more times in this psalm to talk about our proper response to God's law. The Torah is no burden, but a mode of joyous existence, writes Walter Brueggemann. It is perhaps the chief evidence of our fallenness that we think of obedience as a restrictive thing. So, that's a good line uh, from Brueggemann. I'm glad that Dr. Qualls brought it up. So, in, in the understanding of the Torah, a wise person is both obedient outwardly, but also loving inwardly toward God. Uh, the psalmist illustrates uh, through meditation of the law that the law isn't to be understood as a checklist, right? But it's supposed to be used as something like uh, uh, more as a love letter, right? Um, last week, one of the suggestions uh, and discussion questions was to create an acrostic as a class. Psalm 119 is like the ultimate acrostic, right? It's, it's every single Hebrew letter. Um, it's very large, uh, but it dives deeply into words and love and feeling toward God. Uh, but it's not just an exercise in poetry. Instead, it's an illustration of the point of the psalm itself. By using the rules of Hebrew poetry, it forces the psalmist to creativity and a beautiful language. And that's the genius of the psalm. In the same way that Poetry creates boundaries, but then inspires creativity. So the law places boundaries on human actions. But within those boundaries, we learn to use all of our humanness, all right, to be creative and reflect the image of God to the world. We become wise within the boundaries of God's law. It searches us to, or it forces us to search the depths of our humanity in order to live a uh, wise life. And so, again, just like a simple acrostic, uh, makes you think deeper when exploring a word, so the word of God makes you think deeper about the lawgiver, and therefore brings mind, heart, soul, and action all together. So an example, some examples of this, I just brought up a couple of these things. Um, peace. I'm going to show this to you. If you can see it, this is people who have used peace as an ac acronym and, or an acrostic, and this person writes, people united around the world 
end all the world war 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 who wow end all the wars and conflicts uh, all citizens helping each other celebrate peace day after day everyone holding hands in harmony all right so there's one here's one here peace palpitations in every human heart encourage a encourages a human surge to take part activity spawned by love concern and patient desire contribute to an eternal inner burning fire enlightening hope with which we should all aspire and then here's the last one peace perpetual quietude eternal harmony a hush from all the violence calmness and an alliance enjoyed always and so i just uh, highlight those things because basically these were three people who decided to sit down and write something about peace and each of them contribute something but what they had to do was to stop and think in their mind and in their heart what does peace mean and then they had to use their words create creatively and so they thought deeper about the word peace and this is really what happens when we read the hebrew scriptures it takes portions um, of of the hebrew of hebrew words or the hebrew alphabet and then it forces us to become creative and in so doing it illustrates how the law then gives us a form and shape to be creative and obedient and loving in God's alternative world. In the Digging Deeper section, Dr. Qualls writes that these verses are filled with action words, seeking, learning, hiding, following, meditating, contemplating, abiding, remembering, and delighting in the word. Trusting God's word is not a passive thing. It's an invitation to dive in. And yes, you have to leave the safety of dry land to get into the water. You have to say no to one world to experience the freedom of the other. But that's the invitation. He goes on to say, Remember how the TV game show Let's Make a Deal had contestants decide whether or not to take what was behind the curtain or to stick with the prize they already had. They could not fully know what was behind the curtain until after they made their choice. And it was then and only then that it was revealed. Jesus does a similar thing with Simon Peter and the disciples. He invited Sim Simon to simply come and follow him. And Simon did. He left the familiar world of nets and boats, and Simon launched into a new world he could never have imagined, a new world that had been hidden to him, but opened up once he started on the journey. So I think Dr. Wallace hits that really well. We don't study and meditate for the purpose of study and meditating only. Paul says in the New Testament that knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. We study and meditate on the Word of God to love God more, but then we at some point have to go out on faith and obedience. That's how we step. I've known many people who probably have more scripture knowledge than I do, but they have no personal relationship with Christ, and that's what happened with the Pharisees. They knew the law, and they meditated on the law, but as a source of pride, not as a source of love toward God or, or other folks around them. The wisdom of Scripture would make no sense outside of a relationship with God. That's why we say it's foolishness to the Greeks and stumbling blocks to the Jews, right? Choosing to exit this world and its culture and enter into a world of faith and submission and love to God is when the law then animates our uh, Christian wall. So then we go to learning from the Scripture. Dr. Qualls writes, the tension between Christian faithfulness and Christian freedom has existed from the earliest disciples. For example, it appears that an oft-repeated mantra of the church at Corinth was, everything is lawful to me. Having been freed in Christ from the burden of the law, they posited, we can do anything we want. So Paul wrote, I have the right to do anything you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will be mastered. I will not be mastered by anything. I believe the Corinthians were theologically correct. We are free. Therefore, there is now condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Psalm 119, however, shows us that this is much more than simply keeping the law and obeying its rules. He goes on to say, To the unredeemed it, it appears foreign, even foolish, but in order to say yes to this existence that God is opening up to us in the Psalms, we must say no to others. Right? So uh, I believe this is right, and so let me illustrate it by saying this. We have a freedom to choose which reality we're going to follow and develop. 
And the psalm offers a way to follow this al the, an alternative way to the way that's presented by the world and its systems. It's less about obedience than it is about love and relationship. So here's the thing. Every relationship has boundaries, right? In marriage, you take vows, right? Uh, and you become one flesh. But here's the thing. In most marriages, you're free to spend your money any way you want to, right? You are free, right, to do that. But if you choose to spend your money without regard to your relationship with your spouse, although you have freely chosen to exercise your absolute right, that will not create the reality of two uh, people becoming one flesh. Like if you continue to do what you, what you are free to do, but not what you might should do, then in a marriage you remain two people in just a legal contract, not becoming one flesh. And so that's what I think Paul is meaning when you said, yes, you're free to do anything, but or should you in a relationship with God and with other people? Instead, the law says, uh, this is how you should live in wisdom, right? Though you can doesn't mean you should. So anyway, then finally in the applying the scripture section, Dr. Qualls begins with James chapter 1 verses 22 through 25. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. That's James chapter 1, 22 through 25. So again, the law is not a checklist. That's what this psalm is trying to say. It's not a checklist like you have to do at your job before you can go home. But it kind of serves more like marriage vows in a marriage relationship. The law is instruction, it is restriction, and a pledge of faithfulness that force us to live to our fullest humanity in creatively living out the image of God in us to the world and reflecting that image of God back to God in praise. And so... As we end today, this is how this is what Psalm 119 gives us wisdom because it also gives us boundaries and instructions on what it is to please God and to um, to live life faithfully and in a good way among other people. And so, um, pray this is helpful for you. Um, we'll see you again next week. Thanks for all your work in the church. Um, pray for the uh, GA that's going to be coming up next week um, our church needs prayer all the time if there's anything I can do to help you with any type of resource in the church just contact me at cfleming at cumberland.org thank you